Hello, and welcome to this special Social Sciences Week event, Triaging Child Abuse Material Cyber Tips for Investigative Prioritization. Today's webinar is hosted by the School of Social Science and the Institute for Social Science Research, both at the University of Queensland. I'm Mark Weston, the Director of the Institute for Social Science Research. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of all the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the Institute for Social Science Research and the School of Social Science, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd like to also acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. The Institute for Social Science Research is very pleased to be hosting this webinar with the School of Social Science. And we hope you find it both interesting and a strong demonstration of how excellent research contributes to the development of highly impactful approaches to very pressing social problems. It's also extremely timely because in addition to it being Social Sciences Week, it's also National Child Protection Week. We'd encourage you to interact with us throughout the presentation using the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screens. And we will try to get to your questions as soon as we can, both during and after the main presentation. I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Renee Zano from the School of Social Sciences to introduce our speaker. Renee is the organizer of today's event, a lecturer in criminology at the School of Social Sciences, a soon to be Australian Research Council DECRA fellow. And in 2019, she won the highly prestigious Paul Burke Award from the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. The Paul Burke Awards honor Australians in the early part of their career who have already achieved excellence in one or more fields of scholarship in the social sciences. And Renee was an extremely deserving winner of this. So thank you very much, Renee. Thanks so much, Mark, um, for that lovely introduction and thanks for um, introducing our event today. So thanks for joining us, everybody. I hope you'll find today's discussion extremely interesting. I'm here today to, going to introduce you today, our speaker, Dr. David Mount. Um, also with us today are two panelists, um, Professor Lorraine Mazarol, and also we have Lisa James from the Australian Federal Police. They'll be helping to answer your questions as they were also um, part of this project. Um, I'm just going to briefly hand over before I move on to, to handing over to David and giving you a little bit more of an introduction about him. I'm going to hand over to Federal Agent Lisa James, who's just going to tell us a little bit about Child Protection Week. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Renee. Um, I'm just working at the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation, and this week has been a, a really busy week for us because it's National Child Protection Week, which is run by the National Association for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect, NAPCAN. National Child Protection Week in 2020 is running from the 6th, 6th to the 12th of September, and it's held annually across Australia to raise awareness of child abuse and neglect. This year, the National Child Protection Week will mark its 30th year with the theme, Putting Children First, calling on all Australians to play their part to promote safety and the well-being of children and young people. Protecting children is everybody's business and protecting children from sexual exploitation is a whole of community responsibility. It is more important than ever that parents and carers understand the challenges that children and young people face online. And this week we've had a number of NGOs come in here and work with um, at the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation, working together um, in this really important week. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. So I'd now like to hand over to Dr. David um, Mount, who's go who is going to talk to us about the project. So David possesses a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of New South Wales, a Master of Justice from the Queensland University of Technology, and a Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Queensland. During his PhD, he researched investigative interviewing skill acquisition, 
transfer and application in the Queensland Police Service. In recent years, he's been engaged by the university to design, develop and teach undergraduate courses in global security and regulation, and to design the criminology component of a new course offering a master's in cyber security. Thanks so much, David. I'm going to hand over to you now. Okay, thanks very much, Renee, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your attendance uh, in this webinar uh, in what is, uh, I think, uh, a, a crucial uh, area of uh, research and engagement uh, with law enforcement and cooperation between researchers and uh, practitioners. Uh, you see on the screen in front of you uh, what I'm planning to cover uh, this afternoon over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, we'll start with describing the problem uh, as it faces uh, law enforcement and indeed the research community in regards to child abuse material. I'll also uh, then uh, detail the process that is used by uh, the Australian Federal Police to triage and to make decisions about uh, which particular cases are uh, referred for further uh, investigation. Detail the project aims uh, that we had uh, going into this particular uh, project, the methodologies that we used, some results, and importantly also some implications uh, for ongoing uh, research and engagement in this particular field. So starting with the, the problem, and the problem can be encapsulated really in two distinct realms. Um, the first problem is the increasing amount of child abuse material uh, that is being detected by law enforcement uh, and, and the private sector. Uh, in terms of abbreviations, I'll, I'll try and explain abbreviations as I go, uh, but NECMEC stands for the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, and that is a US not-for-profit uh, organisation. Uh, that works with law enforcement agencies in the US and has responsibility for uh, processing uh, from internet service providers, processing uh, cyber abuse, uh, sorry, child abuse material alerts uh, that come in from internet service providers uh, that they identify as being on their system. The concerning thing is that uh, there has been a massive uh, increase in those alerts that have been received by NECMEC um, between 1914, uh, sorry, 2014, where there were 1.1 million alerts, and in 2018, that had increased 18-fold to 18.4 million. And uh, indications at this stage are that those numbers continue to increase uh, during COVID, and uh, uh, it is a uh, an exponential growth in the numbers and the types of reports that are being received. Um, as uh, Lisa identified, uh, ACE stands for the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation, and that is the AFP's uh, organisation with responsibility for uh, triaging uh, and investigating child abuse material uh, offending in Australia, uh, also uh, transnationally. Uh, and in 2018, they dealt with uh, 17,905 reports, which was uh, basically a threefold uh, increase in the number of reports. So the increasing number uh, of child abuse material reports that are being received uh, is a problem. And it could be uh, considered under uh, the heading of representing what is termed a triple A threat. So there is increased accessibility uh, to the internet across society, increased mechanisms to provide anonymity to offenders. And we're also finding uh, both, law, that is law enforcement and researchers are finding that uh, offenders in this space are becoming more and more uh, adaptable. The other part of the problem is the changing nature uh, of harms uh, that are being extended on children. There is a competitiveness amongst offenders to produce never seen before child abuse material, uh, a degree of one-upmanship to produce uh, new uh, material. Um, there's also uh, extensions 
in grooming and ex in sextortion, um, exploitation on demand, which is essentially live streaming of child abuse material. And uh, as I mentioned, increasing use of anonymizing technologies, both on the clear net, but also an expanding use or the presence of uh, child abuse material and activity on the dark net. And there is ongoing debate uh, that has been uh, circling for many years uh, in the psychological, um, medical and sociological, anthropological uh, areas and criminological areas, uh, the debate regarding the connections between online offending and contact sexual offending. So what does that mean for law enforcement? Well, in combination, uh, those two factors are placing increasing strain on law enforcement and their ability to uh, effectively and efficiently uh, prioritise investigative um, matters and allocate appropriate resources uh, to deal with those demands. So um, just to explain the process that is used by uh, the Australian Federal Police um, to triage um, child abuse material and to make recommendations for investigative priority. So the first thing that occurs is that the Australian Centre for uh, to Counter Child Exploitation uh, receives feeds from a variety of sources. The primary source is, as I mentioned, the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children in the US and they provide uh, cyber tip alerts coupled with packages of child abuse material uh, data. Um, and there are also supplementary feeds that come in from different sources and agencies, uh, including public reporting, uh, international law enforcement networks, and the AFP's own uh, uh, transnational uh, law enforcement connections. So those reports come into uh, the ACE, and it's the ACE's job in the child protection triage unit um, to make some determinations based on those cyber tip alerts that they receive. So they assess the content severity, they assess the victim impact and uh, offender identification. They determine possible leads for investigative action. And then they allocate, based on that triaging process, an allocation of investigative priority for referral and subsequent investigation. And so out of that triaging process, decisions are made as to uh, whether or not and with what priority uh, the case is then referred to investigative teams uh, that are co-located with uh, state uh, police forces and services uh, to carry out uh, further investigation and as appropriate uh, arrest and uh, serving of warrants, et cetera, or criminal justice outcomes. Um, so that's the, uh, the process that is used. The project uh, that uh, uh, Lorraine, uh, Renee and I from the University of Queensland uh, in cooperation with the Australian Federal Police and particularly the, the ACE uh, uh, and Federal Agent Lisa James uh, was the coordinating uh, officer from the AFP's point of view. Um, over the space of 12 months, we conducted a, uh, a collaborative project uh, with two key aims. And the first aim was to review the AFP's use of an existing uh, triage tool um, because the AFP had realised that uh, it had some inherent uh, weaknesses and flaws and they needed to uh, improve uh, and make more efficient their triaging and prioritisation processes. So the first aim was to review uh, their way of doing business and the tool that they were using uh, up until that point. The second project aim was then to take the results of that first phase of the project uh, and then to inform the design development and testing of an updated triage tool that identified, uh, that worked to address the identified flaws in the existing triage tool. But importantly, we were looking to maintain a comparable contribution to the achievement of criminal justice outcomes. So in a nutshell, we were very conscious of the fact that uh, we did not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, 
uh, but we needed to come up with a solution that enhanced the AFP's capability um, rather than uh, putting it two steps back in order to go one step forward. So the methodologies that we used uh, in the project uh, was basically four uh, mixed methods uh, across 12 months and across two phases. Uh, in the review of the original triage tool, we used a desktop analysis of the original tool's construct and functionality, uh, and the AFP worked closely with us to ensure that we understood uh, their processes and how uh, they were using the original triage tool. Uh, and then secondly, uh, we conducted a series of interviews with both the triage staff and investigative team leaders in the capital cities. Um, and that was an important input to understand not only the inherent flaws uh, in the existing, uh, or sorry, the original triage tool, um, but we needed their insights as to uh, how to basically improve processes. And it's a point that I'll come back to later on. Uh, it highlights the importance in this type of research of engaging practitioners actively uh, to get their input and their views um, to, to further uh, the capability. Um, because we were very conscious that at the end of the day, uh, it was the AFP that were going to uh, be using this tool. And so they needed to be invested in the development uh, of an updated triage tool. Uh, so uh, that was the, the first uh, part of the, the project, review, reviewing the original triage tool. In the second part of the project, we then took what we'd learnt from the first part and applied it to an updated uh, triage tool that we designed uh, and then tested. Uh, we used a multivariate analysis of 2018 data and uh, conducted uh, a series of quasi-experimental trials um, comparing the original tool with the updated uh, triage tool. So in terms of uh, results, um, from our review of the original tool, basically we found that the old tool wasn't fit for purpose. Uh, it wasn't adequately supporting the triage uh, and evaluation referral functions, uh, and it needed uh, to be updated. Specifically, it was too reliant on information that more often than not was not actually contained in the cyber tip alert that was being received from NECMEC or from the other sources and agencies. Um, and that was specifically related to the suspected offender. So that needed to be addressed. And uh, the other observation that we made uh, through the interviews and through our observation of workplace practices was that the original tool could easily be overridden by the triage staff. Um, with All the good intent in the world, uh, but they were using their professional judgment to produce a preferred risk assessment outcome uh, rather than allowing the, the tool to inform their decision making. So in terms of the updated uh, triage tool, uh, we conducted some logistic regression uh, modelling, or I should say, uh, Renee did. Um, and the interesting thing uh, to come out of the logistic regression modelling that we did of the old uh, tool was that in total, only nine out of the 22 questions contained in the original tool, we found actually were directly related to uh, achieving a criminal justice outcome. So we took those nine questions, uh, considering how important they were, and we incorporated them into uh, the new tool. And we came to the realisation that the referral decision made by the AFP was actually the result of considering the severity of the offending plus consideration of potential solvability. And so our design of the replacement uh, triage tool kept that mantra uh, as its basis uh, for design. So the updated tool uh, ended up being uh, more a decision support tool to enable effective decision making by the triage staff rather than a risk assessment tool. 
and it comprises 17 questions in six individually weighted component parts. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of uh, the weightings or indeed the wordings of the particular uh, questions uh, given security concerns, but um, suffice to say that it is divided into six parts uh, that focuses on the immediate threat of abuse or endanger, endangerment of a child, potential case solvability, uh, assessment of the CAM image or images. Uh, it's also concerned with uh, chat assessment, criticality of the case and um, professional judgment by the triage staff as to um, factors that based on their professional experience and knowledge of this realm, um, they may have a feel for particular uh, factors associated with the case or previous linked cases that might influence uh, this particular case having a higher priority for investigation. Uh, at the end of the trial process, in terms of efficiency, uh, it was found that uh, on average it was taken an inexperienced operator and we used inexperienced operators uh, as, uh, as trial personnel. Um, it was taking them five minutes less uh, than the original tool uh, to complete. So there were some, some significant gains in efficiency. So uh, that was the project, uh, as I said, conducted uh, between uh, June 2019 and July 2020. Um, and I think it had uh, a number of implications in terms of social science research. It was from the outset um, an example of the necessary blend of craft and science. Um, this is certainly not an exact uh, science and it did take um, uh, some consideration in terms of uh, at times how we could uh, adapt for different uh, conditions and circumstances while maintaining uh, the validity uh, of the tool. Um, this project highlighted um, throughout the importance of practitioner researcher uh, collaboration um, and the many benefits to be gained uh, from both sides of the fence. Uh, certainly from uh, a researcher's uh, perspective, uh, it was not only gratifying professionally, um, but also um, uh, uh, really rewarding uh, to work with uh, such a bunch of uh, uh, professional law enforcement officers. Um, and I think there were some also some mutual benefits to be gained uh, out of the uh, university and AFP uh, partnership. Um, this was uh, to the, certainly to the best of my knowledge, uh, it was the, the first time uh, from a, a university perspective uh, that we had actually uh, embedded uh, a research officer with the AFP uh, to work in daily close collaboration uh, with them on a, on a research uh, project. And uh, what it has done is that it has uh, established a, a close working uh, relationship. And, uh, and in fact, we now at the University of Queensland for the first time uh, have two um, honours students uh, conducting their honours research uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the ACE uh, as well, looking at uh, the issue of uh, child abuse material and child abuse material offending. I think this process, uh, this project also uh, highlights the importance of considering human factors uh, in terms of cyber criminology research. Um, too often and traditionally, uh, cyber has largely been uh, focused on the contributions of uh, the technical uh, side of the house. Um, but this project, particularly the practitioner researcher relationship, has demonstrated the, um, the value of considering uh, human factors in the commission of cyber crime to understand uh, how uh, offenders think and uh, what motivates them and how they actually 
conduct uh, their cyber criminal activities uh, is just as important as to understanding their technical means of attack and their te technical modes of operation. And I think this project also portends uh, some further opportunities for research in the cybercrime uh, realm. Uh, our involvement in the child abuse material uh, arena um, is, uh, is really, you know, first, first time uh, for, for us. It, it was first time for us and it presents uh, a, an opportunity to continue our involvement in the cybercrime realm and to expand uh, that, those research interests, not only locally, but also uh, as part of the transnational uh, crime problem. And I go back to the value or the mutual benefits to come out of the relationship between the UQ and uh, the AFP. And I think from a University of Queensland point of view, uh, this project has also pointed towards the uh, potential opportunities associated with building uh, a more general um, cyber crime, uh, cyber security centre of excellence. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, residual and side benefits uh, for certainly for the University of Queensland and for social science uh, to come out of this project, uh, not only uh, in addition to what we were able to contribute to uh, the AFP's capabilities uh, going forward. Um, so that was uh, all I had to uh, cover this afternoon. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to being able to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much for that, David. That was really interesting and, and informative. What I'd like to do now is just open the floor for questions. So what you'll see um, down the bottom is the Q&A box. So please feel free to start um, typing your questions in there and we'll, I'll start reading some out and we'll start answering them. And there's a question here about the, some of the challenges of um, working together across uh, the university and across the ACE Centre. So maybe that's a question that um, both Lisa and David could um, could answer. Oh, yes, that's a great idea. Lisa, would you like to speak to that first? Sure, I'll speak to that. Um, is my sound working in my video? Yes, you're on. Okay. I guess like the challenges of working together were that um, we had to get all the necessary permissions from within our own organisation, which was a bit of a time consuming uh, effort to get a security clearance for everybody who needed to work with us and to also have them psychologically cleared, um, plus all the other admin responsibilities and duties that are involved. But it was worth it in the long run. And um, I'm looking forward to the second phase of this project where um, we'll be able to work together again and I won't have to go through all of that because we've already been there and done that. Um, other than that, it was, it was mainly just those security things that were the, the challenges. Um, we really enjoyed working with, the, um, with Dr. David Mount and with Professor Lorraine Maserol um, on this project. It was really interesting and enjoyable to see how academia and, uh, and the AFP could work together. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was great. Um, we've got another question. Um, if, if you'd like to answer that question that's up there now, David. Sorry, I don't have visibility of the question, Renee. Oh, right. Okay, so Paul's asking, um, he'd like to understand more about the processing of, of the data. So he's asking about the questions when the the officers um, see the questions. He's asking, are any automated or is, or is all judgment done by humans? Um, so, you know, when, when the judgment on the questions in the tool come through, is that done by human interaction? And what about, um, he's asking about inter-rater reliability. Okay, so probably the, the best way to answer that question is to say that uh, the, the questions in the tool uh, are weighted uh, in relation to having individual uh, values.
placed against each uh, particular question, um, but the the scoring or, or the um, the response against each question uh, is conducted by uh, the triaging officer. So uh, no, the, the it is not. There is not an incorporation at, at this stage of any form of artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence processing. Uh, it is all done by humans uh, based on a series of uh, weighted questions. Okay, thanks so much for that, David. Um, there is a, another question up there now. Um, the, Mark's um, just pointed out to me as well, which I'd like to, I was going to mention at the end, but I will mention now that um, Paul's brought up the issue of automated approaches. Tomorrow there is another seminar that's being conducted at ISSR and it's called Ethical Data Science for Social Impact. Um, and this will be, this seminar will be discussing issues such as automated approaches to um, to date to looking at text um, and also utilizing automated approaches to support um, decision support decision support tools so you can come along to that tomorrow um, that'll be conducted by ISSR and you can find out more information on the ISSR website okay um, there's another question there um, asking saying that um, asking how long the original um, assessment was taking the original tool yeah sorry I've, I've, <laughs> I've just found the Q and a button remote. right no problem apologies <laughs> um, yeah uh, thanks Paul uh, to answer your question uh, I guess the the original uh, triage tool was taking an experienced operator uh, approximately between 10 to 15 minutes to complete uh, for each case. Um, now, there are a number of reasons why uh, it was taking that long for each individual case, and it was probably more to do with uh, process uh, rather than the actual content of the original tool. So, um, while, we've say, while we have said that there has been an improvement in uh, efficiency with the new tool, that will be heightened even further uh, when uh, the, the process is streamlined between operating systems uh, at the AFP. Um, I'd, I'd ask Lisa just to confirm or, or deny that, uh, that comment from her point of view as the triage team leader. Uh, but that was certainly our, our perception of the saved efficiency uh, at the end of the trial period. Thank you, David. Yes, there was um, definitely a saved efficiency with the new triage tool compared to the old triage tool. There was a lot more uh, cutting and pasting of irrelevant information that was required in the old tool, which we've now got rid of. And also it's more just easily more clicking buttons rather than actually entering data. Thanks, Lisa. And Lisa, about how many cases would an operator encounter on an average working day in, in your office? Uh, so I can talk about last Saturday, we had 112 matters that we had to triage. There's two people that triage at any one point and that took us all day. Yes. But that was a long day. <laughs> because it was Saturday. Normally we'd split it and we'd try and get more people to triage. So we might have four or six people triaging to try and get through that work quicker. But some days it can be, um, you know, today was 24, I think. And other days it can be much more. Is there a pattern um, where certain days of the week are more busy? Uh, yes, because most of our work comes from the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. And say, for example, on Monday, it was a public holiday in America. So um, nobody worked over there. So that means that, you know, we'll have more work during the week because they'll need to catch up. So a lot depends on what's happening in America and because of COVID and they're not 
working from the office, they're working from home, that faces additional challenges as well. Sure. Okay, any other, any other questions from the group? All right, so we've got one here. Um, someone's asking, I wonder if the tool also looked at recommended actions or actions post triage um, or only efficiency in completing the tool. So um, did you want to speak to this, David? Okay, um, I guess the, the best way to answer that question is to say that the, uh, the project was primarily focused on uh, the triaging process. So the decision making required to process a case once it was received from NetMEC or another source and agency, the determination that is made by the triage staff as to whether uh, an individual case is progressed or referred for further investigative action. So to answer that question, no, our focus wasn't on post triaging and the work that is done by the investigative teams once a matter is referred down to them for investigation. It was solely concentrated on the triage process and the decision making required by the triage staff to make a determination of investigative priority and referral. So maybe Lisa, it's worthwhile sort of saying about that interface with the investigators. Sorry, Lorraine, could you repeat that? So maybe it might also be good to talk about that interface between the triage team and the investigators. Oh yeah, so after triage, triage is only um, a small part of our work in the child protection triage unit. We actually do the investigation. So by the time the matter goes out the door from here and it heads on its way to the state or territory police, uh, we pretty much have the shell of their search warrant ready for them. So we have identified um, the linkages between the evidence, the suspect, we put them to an address and um, identified any other important information such as if they've got any warnings or flags, if they've been um, convicted of any offences previously, things like that. So by the time it goes to the uh, joint anti-child exploitation teams, it's, it's a pretty good investigation and they just need to do the finalising parts and check it all before they go and get their search warrant. Okay, thanks so much for that. Um... Lisa. We did have another question there about what is triaging. I think that Lorraine's just responded to that. So triaging is, is about making decisions on which cyber tips will be progressed um, first and as a priority. Um, David, could you just say a little bit more um, about the craft and science of doing this work? Because that's actually a very interesting point. So Mark's just um, raising this to, you know, discuss a little bit further. And this is yeah. a really important thing to think about in Social Science Week. Yeah. So I guess um, probably the probably the best example of blending craft and science was uh, came about during the. Uh, the design and, and trial phase of the project. Um, and it, it became uh, quite apparent that we needed, uh, we needed to come up with a solution that um, achieved the, the input of the practitioners. Um, and we needed to um, take those nine very valuable questions from the original tool but we also needed to um, consider uh, other influences and other factors in the, 
um, in the current work environment of the triage staff that only the practitioners could actually um, highlight for us. So we, you know, we the tool, the new tool was was developed on the on the on the firm basis of of evidence, research evidence, but it was also fashioned mindful of uh, the the need to for it to be uh, adaptive and and for it to be workable uh, for the AFP to use. So I guess that's what I'm talking about in terms of the blend of of um, a, a strong research evidence base, but also um, crafted in a way that it is usable for the practitioner. Thanks, David. Mark, did you have any more that you wanted to um, sort of add about any lessons that you've learnt in this space? Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, I wasn't, wasn't expecting to be asked too much. I, I thought I'd put you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. Um, look, look I, I guess I would say that um, in the Institute for Social Science Research, where, where we also, you know, work um, with partners in, in healthcare, um, in the way that David's talking about it. I, I think this is a, it, it's a consideration that is, is really important. That if, if you want to work with partners to try to um, use your research expertise um, to, to try to help address problems that really matter to them that have to be, have to be solved um, in a real world context, you, you need to recognize- uh, Just to interrupt you, you're very faint. Oh, okay. Apologies, apologies. I, um, <laughs> Deliberately disengaged my mic so that I wouldn't I wouldn't get in the way. But um, um, so so in our experience working with partners, is that better? Yep. Yes, that's yep. great. In our experience working with partners, you do have to also um, recognise the expertise that partners bring and um, the particular knowledge that they have. And and we also find as part of the craft that sometimes some of the things that we think about as as so-called scientific best practice are not really going to work um, in, in the context of a real world research project. And, and, and part of the expertise then is what can we find that is similar, that is workable in a, in a context, um, but where we, um, where we can um, be confident that we are getting results that will be similar if, um, if we were able to do uh, scientific best practice. And one of the commonest examples would be where we are perhaps involved in trying to design a, a tool um, or, or an, um, an intervention of some sort, and we want to evaluate that. Um, and we know in many, in many circumstances that the best way to try and evaluate that intervention is with some kind of experimental design. But we also know that our partners, for various reasons, quite legitimate, um, are not able uh, to, to run a randomised experiment um, in, in the context of doing their daily work. And so we would need to look, I imagine, in the way that you did, um, at alternative ways to try to get a similar outcome, but that would also, also be feasible. And, and I think this is um, you know, something that really tests our expertise um, as researchers to be able to work on these kinds of problems. And I, I also think it's highly desirable that, that our our junior researchers and our PhD students learn that this is how, you know, research around real world problems actually works a lot of the time. Um, and we should be making, encouraging them and providing them with support and experiences that make them comfortable uh, to do that kind of work. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, so we've got one more question here. Um, can, this is for you, Lisa. Um, can you comment on the type of training the triage team had before using the new tool? Thank you, Renee. Yes, we had David come in and um, conduct a training session for the staff. So he came in and explained how we'd gone about the process and how he would had um, conducted his research. And then we had a look at the tool and we also had built into the tool some little um, helpers so if you didn't remember one of the one of the particular points of the question you can hover over a question mark and it'll give you a definition so we just had about probably an hour or so's training before we started using the tool and we've only had it live now for just over one month sure thanks lisa and there are some um 
good reasons why to use um, people that were not too experienced with the tool. Um, I guess in trialing a new tool, um, this demonstrates the effectiveness and efficiency of the tool if it doesn't take a tedious amount of training in order for people to be able to use it and to be able to use it in a, in a reliable and efficient manner. Did you want to add any more about that, Lorraine? Sure, so we did um, uh, do a number of um, pilot runs with the experience team as well. So, um, so that we could uh, look at the, the differences between the experience team and the inexperienced team um, across a range of different types of, um, of cyber tips and across a range of what was already known in terms of the outcomes. So I do, I do want to just come back to this, um, uh, this theme of merging craft and science. I do think that it's a, it's a classic partnership approach. And, um, it, you know, I, I think that what's, um, uh, what's very good about a partnership approach to, uh, uh, to developing new interventions, and uh, in this case, a new triage tool, is that researchers working in isolation can often um, obvious errors um, and um, uh, practitioners working in isolation from um, uh, from the evidence and from the science part of it can also um, be uh, um, going down the wrong path as well. So it's it's about bringing together the strengths of both um, industry and um, academics working from the science space to bring about a better outcome. And I really do think that the um, the trust that was developed between the ACE team and Lisa's crew and uh, David at the front line of the um, academic team, I think is a real exemplar of how this type of very applied research can be done in the real, in real world settings. Thanks so much, Lorraine. I might um, cl close the session there, um, but before I do that, I do just wanna give another plug to tomorrow's session um, with ISSR on ethical data science for social impact. So if you wanna know more about that, please go to the ISSR website. I wanna really want to thank today's speaker, Dr. David Mount. I would also like to thank the panelists, um, Professor Lorraine Mazarol, um, Federal Agent Lisa James, and also um, Professor Mark Weston for coming along, for being here today. Um, and also for such an interesting presentation and congratulate them on a really excellent project and an, ex an exemplary um, project in terms of blending the academic side of social sciences with practitioner work. Um, so thank you very much and thanks for attending today, everybody. Happy Social Science Week. And please ask, ask your um, friends and colleagues, are they okay today? It's also, are you okay day? Thank you.